Happy New Year. Because this is our first Sunday in this year, we're going to ask you to do something just a little bit different. I know you're comfortable in your famous, your favorite pew. We're going to ask that if you can just get up and greet someone you haven't seen since last year and tell them thank you for being here this morning. Can you do that for me? My name is Pastor Jacques Antoine Conway. I'm here with Greg and we, who serves as our worship leader, and we're just so grateful for all of you who've come to be part of this first service in the year 2024. God is good all the time, all the time. God is good. Today's reading comes from the scripture of Luke, chapter 7, verses 36 to 50. One of the Pharisees asked Jesus to eat with him, and when he went into the Pharisee's house, he reclined to dine. And a woman in the city who was a sinner, having learned that he was eating in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster jar of ointment. She stood behind him at his feet, weeping, and began to bathe his feet with her tears and to dry them with her hair, kissing his feet and anointing them with the ointment. Now when the Pharisee who had invited him saw it, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would have known who and what kind of woman this is who is touching him, that she is a sinner. Jesus spoke up and said to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. Teacher, he replied, speak. A certain money lender had two debtors, one owed 500 denarii and the other 50. When they could not pay, he canceled the debts for both of them. Now which of them will love him more? Jesus answered, I suppose, Simon answered, I suppose the one for whom he canceled the greater debt. And Jesus said to him, you have judged rightly. Then turning toward the woman, he said to Simon, do you see this woman? I entered your house, you gave me no water for my feet, but she has bathed my feet with her tears and dried them with her hair. You gave me no kiss, but from the time I came in, she has not stopped kissing my feet. You did, not anoint my he- you did not anoint my head with oil, but she has anointed my feet with ointment. Therefore, I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven. Hence, she has shown great love. But the one to whom little is forgiven loves little. Then he said to her, your sins are forgiven. But those who were at the table with him began to say among themselves, who is this who even forgives sins? But he said to the woman, your faith has saved you, go in peace. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. First, let me thank all of you who contributed to the Christmas love offerings to the staff and myself. Appreciate you all's kindness. I truly appreciate my first uh, time in many years being in a local church celebrating Christmas with a congregation. I love the singing, the, the bells, the gathering. It was just, it felt so good to be part of a worship experience again as a pastor. And you all just really uh, brought joy to my heart to be in the local church. Uh, it is a good time to be in God's house. What better place to be than to celebrate God's goodness, God's grace, God's mercy, God's forgiveness, and even God's healing. And so I stand before you on this first Sunday, peacock happy for the fact that God has brought all of us here uh, for this time in the life of his church. It's a wonderful time. People think that the church is on a decline. I'm telling you, the church is right where it needs to be because the real saints will come into to the form and realize there's nothing that can separate us from the love of God. We have gone through a lot in this church since last year, but yet God is still blessing this congregation and there's more blessings to come for those who are dependent upon God's love and God's guidance and that we use our gifts. Each one of us has a gift and that gift that God has given us, we use it for his glory, amen. My wife asked me, where did you get that title from? (laughs) Church Hurt. Um, As I was, as I I mentioned earlier, uh, I am a student of the scripture. I just think there's just so much 
involved in the scripture that you can preach, you can take the same text and preach 12 different messages from it because it has that many arms that goes out. And so this particular text really excited me because there's so many things involved in it that it kind of stirred up my, my, my heart. And one of them is the fact that Jesus had a way of teasing the Pharisees and the Sadducees. <laughs> he, he had a way of putting them in their, in their place every opportunity that he got. Anytime they thought they had something on Jesus, Jesus would come back to them, and then they would walk away in shame and embarrassment because they, their arms, as the, the, the play used to what was written, their arms was too short to box with God. And this particular time, uh, Jesus was invited by the Sadducees and Pharisees, which were the religious leaders of the time. They were the connection between the temple and the government. Uh, and they walked around dressed in fine linen. They were uh, the, 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 the cream of the crop. Uh, they were the very important people in town. They, they knew people who knew people. And, and so they walked with a sense of air throughout the time. And they caught the attention, Jesus caught their attention, so they wanted to see, hey, how can we get this guy into our camp? Let us invite him to a deal, to a dinner. Let us invite him to a meal. Let us sit at a table and get to know him even further, and, and we'll see how we can work this relationship to our advantage. So they invited Jesus, and he came. And it's interesting that in those days that uh, they ate uh, at a table that was actually on the floor. I, I celebrated Ramadan for back in the 90s in, uh, in, in Egypt. And it was interesting because the person who I celebrated with was my taxi driver. And so when I got off the plane, I went to, the, the conference went to Jerusalem with Bishop Duker, and then I decided to take an excursion, as I typically do, by myself to Egypt. I was like, this close to Egypt, I'm going to go to Egypt. They said, you can't go. you got to stay with the group. I said, the group didn't pay for me to come here. The group can't tell me where I can go. So I took a flight by myself over to Egypt, and when I got off the plane and I walked through to the outside, I saw probably a 1,000 people. I said, oh, my God, I am scared out of my pants. So I began to walk, and I picked the littlest guy as my taxi driver, so I figured if nothing else, I can handle this guy. So I got in the back seat, and another person got in front of me, got in the front seat. I said, like, oh, my goodness. So I said, so listen, take me to, do you all, what kind of hotels? They had a Marriott. I said, oh, take me to the Marriott. And in the Marriott, I asked the bellhop, I said, listen, I want to do a tour. Uh, can you get someone to work with me? And he said, I got a cousin. He has a car. And he picked me up. And this was the season of celebrating Ramadan. And I always heard of Ramadan because uh, Keem Elijah Wan, when he played basketball, he, they always talked about how weak he was during the season of Ramadan. And so at that table selling their Ramadan, you literally got on your knees. The table was on the floor, and you shared the plates together. And I didn't know that. So the kid of the family kept reaching into my plate to get something to eat. And I was like, yeah. man, keep your hands out of my plate, right? And I was told, no, 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 no. We, we eat off the same plate. I'll never forget that. And so I rem this scene reminds me as I was sitting down, sitting at a table, literally on my knees, and my feet were behind me, it reminded me of this case where this woman came up to Jesus, and she literally washed his feet. Because then your, their feet were dusty. And she wanted to, when you come into a house, they had a bowl where you wash each other's feet so that you would not carry it into the house. And they didn't do that for Jesus, but she knew that was the custom. And so she got behind Jesus and washed his feet, not with the water that they gave, but with her tears. And she didn't dry his feet with a towel. She dried his feet with her hair. That had to drive these religious folks batty. Not only did this woman come into their home uninvited, <laughs> but she had an intimate and personal touching relationship with this man called Jesus. 
And of course, Jesus being who he was, he ridiculed those people who took offense to this woman. And when I read this story, it reminded me of a time back in the early 90s where there was a conference on AIDS in Indianapolis at a United Methodist church called St. Luke. St. Luke in Indianapolis is the largest United Methodist church in that city. And they had this conference on AIDS and people came from all over and it was just a wonderful experience. And the, the, the keynote speaker was a mother, was a, was a woman named Miss White. And she began to talk about her son, Ryan White. You all remember Ryan White? And so she began to tell the stories that he needed a blood transfusion and in, in, in that he ended up getting affected by uh, HIV virus. And the word got out, and so there had to be a court order for her to actually let Ryan continue to go to school because they wanted to bar him from the school. And a place that she felt that she had some support was the church. But in the church setting, people did not directly deny her access to worship, but behind the scenes, you know, there's a meeting, and there's a meeting after the meeting. Well, there was a meeting after the meeting. They decided that they were going to pressure the pastor to make sure that Ryan White would not be able to come to church because they were afraid of the HIV virus being spread. And the pastor started off and said, well, listen, you know, uh, you know Ryan can't really drink from the same water fountain as the other people do. And, 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 and we don't want him using the, the bathroom over here. If he really has to go to the bathroom, he, he can use, use my, my, my bathroom. And, and, and so she was, this mother, Miss White, was so frustrated by all this was going on. And it, and it just reminded me that, and I asked her the question. I said, so, and her sister said, so where was the church? And she gave me that story. She said, this is how the church treated my son, Ryan. And she says, to this day, I will always remember how what I didn't get from the church when I needed the most. And that's where this title came, Church Hurt. We have people who come into this sanctuary, including today, who come in with pain and suffering. And it was more, it became more reality to me on Blue Christmas, my first Blue Christmas here, when we had these little notes, and in these notes, people can write in what they wanted to be, have, to be prayed over. And so I still have those notes because I pray over them daily. And as I read these notes, I, I read, person says, uh, I am lonely. I am depressed. Various things that they wrote on this little blue sheet of paper that they wanted prayer over. And I says, these are people who come into our church every day single week who were involved in committees I I don't I didn't I didn't know the names on it but I remember the faces and I just imagined myself seeing these people on a regular basis and thinking you are coming to this church hurt week after week but you keep coming back because you know you can find some healing you can find some compassion you can find some forgiveness you can find some friendship and that's why people come back to church, because they know on the in south side of the world they do not have that same support. Church hurt, though, when we drive people away from the church, that is, I feel, the biggest sin against God. When we use our positions or our power or our voice or our finances or whatever else tools that we use, to drive away the love of God, to drive people away from forgiveness and compassion and use. Church hurt. Our first bishop in United Methodist Church was Cokesbury, Coke, Bishop Coke. And now we have, our, you know, our, 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 our printing company is named after him, Cokesbury. That was in the 1700s. <laughs> Our first two women bishops were in 1980s. Cokesbury was the first in the 1700s. Bishop Marjorie was, was the first woman in 1980, uh, uh, Caucasian woman, and African American woman was Bishop Kelly in 1984. 1700s, 
1900s, 200 plus years where the church decided that the woman was not good enough to be a bishop. 200 years. Church hurt. And we since changed. Now the pendulum has switched, changed. We've had more election of women than men. And I can tell you firsthand that I was a candidate for Bishop to last our last election. And I was told <laughs> by the delegation that you got the qualifications, but this is the year of the woman. <laughs> I just said, God bless them. It ain't meant to be. Church hurt is something we can have an impact on every time we walk into the door. Every time we have a meeting, every time we have a fellowship, we have to realize that this structure that we call the building, Faith United Methodist Church, is just an opportunity for God's people to gather of hurt and pain and joy and misunderstandings, to come into this place and be under the umbrella of love. This woman in our scripture understood that even though this was not her house, she decided to make herself a guest in it anyway. Even though she was not invited to the dinner, she came to the dinner table and ministered to Christ with all of her pain and all of her suffering because she knew no matter what, no matter who was around her, she could find relief. She could find acceptance. She could find some joy in ministering to Christ who ministered to her. And in that way, we can use that as a way to eliminate church hurt. I understand the world's hurt. That's what we do in the world. Dog eat dog world. You know, we, we fight all of our excitements in the sports. And what do we like about sports? Because we have a winner <laughs> and we have a loser. What do we like about our society? We go to schools. Well, I, I am a I go to DePaul. Well, I go to Loyola. Well, I, we're the best school here. No, I'm the best school there. We, we are very competitive in the world. And that's what the world calls us to do is be very competitive. But when we come to God's house, we're all the same. And what hurts me now is that in, I never understood how dysfunctional an organized structure could be until I became United Methodist. I came out of the Catholic Church, and I just realized I knew the Catholic Church was very, very, very dysfunctional. But it wasn't until I became United Methodist Church that I realized that we have our islands of, of dysfunction. <laughs> As a district superintendent, I spend most of my time traveling 120 miles every day to fires to put out. Traveling all over. My district was from almost Kankakee, which is Willington, all the way to downtown, from Indiana to Lockport. And in that were 67 churches with 67 plus pastors and 67 plus staff parish relations committees and 67 finance committees and structures and all kinds of things going on. And I found myself thinking, man, we are part of a very dysfunctional <laughs> operation. No wonder we can't make uh, disciples of Jesus Christ. But in the midst of that, on Sundays, when the music is sung and the sermon is preached and people gather, they don't remember, they don't have any, any recognition of all those dysfunctions that are going on outside of that meeting. Because they came to be blessed by God. It has saddened me that in our, this time in our church life, we've lost thousands of churches who have separated themselves from being called United Methodists. And that is something that we have to accept as a body of Christ because this is not our church, this is God's church. And in some form or fashion, I believe, like this, this, this denomination has broken up and come back together and broken up and come back together, maybe in my grandchildren's time the church will come back together again. Who knows? But in the midst of that, my prayer is always that God will lead you to where you need to be, and if you serve God with your heart and your soul, no matter what your personal theology is, our prime objective is, is to make disciples for Jesus Christ. Christ showed that in his acceptance of this woman, this sinner, who stepped out of her woman's zone 
into this man's world and decided that she was going to be what Christ needed her to be for her life. And she stepped out. And she set aside that church hurt and decided to give all that she could to her Savior. And that was her tears and her physical touch. Simply to say, Lord, I love you and I need you. The, the most simplest form of devotion and it comes from her heart. And Jesus responded by chastising those who chastise her. He said, listen, your dysfunction is not her dysfunction. She did what you all should have done, but she didn't have enough love and respect for me. And that's why she is forgiven, and she turned out to be one of his better, more faithful followers. On this first Sunday in the year 2024, we will celebrate the Lord's Supper the first communion of this year. And no matter when we celebrate it, the message is still the same, that Jesus came so his life could be broken so that we may be made whole. And every time we celebrate this communion, we celebrate God's love, God's acceptance, God's, God's understanding, and God's promise. And you all know what that is. I will never leave you. I'll never forsake you, and I always will love you. And that's why we celebrate this communion. And I love the fact that every time I think about it, I literally believe that God is present in whatever elements we use to take in and to say, this is his body, which was broken for us. This is his blood, which was shared for us. For us, not for himself, for us. And this woman who came to this house, it wasn't about her. It was the love that she had for her Savior because her Savior gave her the outlook that she had never received her whole, whole life. And that was that you are loved. We are loved, my sisters and brothers. No matter what happens with us physically, emotionally, financially, personally, we are loved. And I can't wait to preach my sermon on hope. I think that's the best words that we have in our English language. It's hope. Hope is a promise. Hope is a destination. Hope is what we stand on every single time we rise out of our sleep. Hope. Hope. Not the lottery. Not the World Series. Not the Super Bowl. Not our retirement. Not all those things that we think are important in our lives, but what's, hope is, what's mostly important for us is simply hope. And that's what worship gives us every time we come. That's what our relationships and friendship does for us every time we're shared. That's what God gives us in our, in our souls, that we have hope and that we know that God would never leave us nor forsake us. Church hurt can really be painful, and, can, and it can be debilitating. But I'm going to tell you that if we believe in Christ, we will be able to rise up from those situations and understand the importance of the message that God gave us through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We must keep hope in our hearts. We must not walk by sight, but by faith. We must not live by circumstances. And lock ourselves away because of what's happening around us. We must step out and know that we are a child of God. No matter what our age, income, where we're from, where we're going. But we have a promise from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ that will never be broken. And I stand before you as this woman, this mother of Ryan White said to me, no matter what the church did, no matter what the church didn't do, I still love God's church and God's people. It was just those individuals who didn't do right, but it wasn't God. God did not punish my son. God did not bring down hell and death with my son because of something he did or didn't do. Because ultimately, as any race that we run, our goal is to get to the finish line. No matter if you're first, 
or you're the 31st. Our goal is to get to the finish line, and we each have to run our own race. So this, my brothers and sisters, is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Before I give the benediction, I want to thank you on behalf of the staff and myself for your Christmas offering of love. Thank you for your generosity. Thank you for the cookies and cakes and breads uh, that I've gotten personally that I would say I can't take anymore until the spring. Uh, I am now on my official first of the year diet, so I, I have to put my treats aside. And thank you for this wonderful season with our music that we've had, the celebration. I, again, my, my joy is just overflowing to be in worship, <laughs> celebrating the great season of Christmas. And uh, uh, Sally, we thank you for your leading this, the choir of the parishioners last week, too, with the, with the mic. You were our lead vocalist. Thank you for that, my darling. Thank you. Multi-talented. And so we want to say to all of you, this is a wonderful time for us, not only for the first Sunday of this year, but we have 51 left. So do your best to give God all your glory and come and celebrate God's gifts and God's graces, God's mercy and God's love and God's celebration of all of us. Go in peace, my sisters and brothers. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.